all righty howdy folks we are moving on to chapter four isn't that fascinating so chapter four is about higher order differential equations and this uh, section 4.1 it just covers some you know some of the basics of these higher order differential equations okay let's look at that uh, the first thing is as a definition I need to tell you what an initial value problem is I think I did talk about this even with first order differential equation but now if it's an nth order initial value problem uh, what exactly does that look like so here we are talking about just linear equations. Let's not worry about nonlinear equations. So we know that uh, an nth order linear differential equation has this form. Now what makes it an initial value problem? Well, along with this nth order differential equation, if you were to have some initial conditions, right? You remember initial condition concept from first order differential equation. For instance, uh, in, in that problem that I talked about where you had the LR circuit, it had I of zero equals I sub zero, meaning the current flowing in that at a zero time is I sub zero, right? So that's an initial condition in the same way for an nth order value, nth order initial value problem, you must have initial conditions. But now, the interesting thing about this is, you will have many more conditions. For example, if you if you have nth order, you will have n initial conditions. So let's look at them. What is the first condition? It says y at x sub 0 is some y sub 0. y is the variable. x sub 0 is some specific value of x. At that specific x equal to x sub 0, the y has a specific value of y sub 0. y sub 0 is just a constant, some number. For instance, I could have something like y of 0 equals 3. Then x sub 0 is 0 and y sub 0 is 3. Cool. In addition to that, the second condition would be y prime of x sub 0 is some constant y0 prime. Now, I want you to be very clear about something here. I know it's a tad confusing, but you get kind of used to this stuff. What do we mean by y prime? The derivative of y, right? Now, what do we mean by y0 prime? we do not mean derivative of y0. That's awfully confusing, right? What do you mean is a prime ref represents something on the left-hand side, but it represents a completely different thing on the right-hand side? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, you are right. On the left-hand side, when we say y prime, it is the derivative, whereas this whole thing, y0 prime, is just a constant, some number. Again, as an example, I could say something like, Hey, uh, y prime of 0 is equal to 5. That's what we mean by y prime of x sub 0 equals y sub 0. And so on. y double prime of x sub 0 should be y 0 double prime and so on. All the way up to the n minus 1 the derivative. Okay. Uh, oh, I should have had the parenthesis around n minus 1 here also. y to the n minus 1 the prime evaluated at x sub 0 should be some y0 raised to n minus 1. Some, not, it's not n minus, raised to n minus 1. Uh, think of it as the n minus 1 th prime. Uh, you get the idea, right? y0 prime is just a constant. y0 double prime is a constant. y0 to the parenthesis n minus 1, that's also just a stupid number. Okay. But this is the n minus 1 the derivative. So what is more important for you to recognize is when you have an nth order differential equation, you will have n initial conditions. 
How come there are n man? There's only y to the n minus one. It says n minus one. Yeah, but this is a y to the zero, right? So this sequence starts with zero, zero, one, two, three, all the way to n minus one. Zero to n minus one is actually n number of points. Okay, all right. So this is what an initial value problem is. Now you might be wondering, what do you, where y0, all these are constants, and x0 is some point in the domain, yeah. Um, this differential equation is valid in a, over a certain interval, and that interval is the domain. And so x0 must be a point inside that domain, okay. You might ask, what do you mean this, I don't understand what this initial value problem is and all that. I don't know if you'll believe me or not, but those of you who have taken physics, you have already seen a higher order differential equation with initial values. You, I mean, you have already seen a second order initial value problem in physics. Let me show you that. Do you remember this formula? Uh, a particle moving along a line its position x is given by its initial position x sub i plus its initial velocity v sub i times t plus one half a is the acceleration. Acceleration should be constant here in this case. t squared, t is the time. We remember this one, x equals x sub i plus v sub i t. Where did that come from? That came from solving this differential equation, x double prime is equal to a. What? I don't think I've ever seen that equation in physics, man. Uh, well, you did. Quite possibly, the physics people, like engineers do, uh, would have called this as x double dot, put two dots on top of x. That x double dot simply indicates derivative, second derivative with respect to t or d square x dt square, that's what they mean, right? So d square x dt square is nothing but your a, the acceleration. Let's say acceleration is constant. Then what exactly is x? Can you solve for x? Now, do you notice this is actually a second order differential equation? x double prime. Uh, like 1x double prime plus 0x prime plus, uh, sorry, yeah, okay, yeah, 1x double prime plus 0x prime plus 0x is equal to some constant a, right? And this is subjected to initial conditions. The position of the particle at time 0 is some x sub i, which is just a constant in the sense X of, X of zero is three meters. That means you draw a number line and it's going along a straight line. The particle is moving along a straight line and at t time t equal to zero, it's three meters to the right of the origin. And X prime of zero, its speed is V sub i, some initial speed V sub i. Uh, you have to specify the direction in the sense if you say v sub i is three meters per second then that means mm, pay attention to this when we say v sub i is three meters per second that means the particle is moving to the right at a speed of three meters per second now on the other hand if x of x prime of zero is negative three meter per second. What do you mean the speed is negative, man? Uh, well, that means its direction is to the left. Positive direction is considered to be right, let us say. Then the negative direction is considered, positive direction is considered to be right. Then left would be considered negative direction. That's the idea. Okay, so we have uh, an initial value problem for sure. We have a differential equation, second order. We have an initial condition on x itself and on x prime. That's the whole idea. 
And what is another important thing that you need to see here is, let me go back to that guy. Notice y of where at x sub 0. Where was y prime stated? Same x sub 0. Where was y double prime stated? At x equal to x sub 0. So all these values, the functions value, the y value, the y prime value, all of these things must be stated at the exact same x point. That is one of the absolute conditions. That is one of the imperative things for uh, these conditions to be initial conditions. And so keeping uh, armed with that piece of information, this has to make sense to you. X is being stated at t equal to zero, then X prime also better be stated at t equal to zero. Right? So with that, how do we solve this differential equation? Well, in this case, because things are fairly straightforward, we could do a simple integration approach. X double prime equals A. Well, integrate both sides. Can you do that? Yeah, of course you can. So when you integrate X prime, X double prime with respect to T, you just get X prime. Right? D square X DT square with respect to DT, with respect to T, if you integrate, you get DX DT. On the right hand side, you get AT, A is a constant, plus some arbitrary constant C sub 1. Now, can we figure out what C1 is? Yes, we can. How? By applying this initial condition on X prime. This says when t equal to 0, x prime is v sub i. We'll go ahead and plug that. Apply x prime of 0 equals v sub i. So c1 becomes v sub i. How? Well, I replaced x prime with a v sub i. a times 0 is 0, 0 plus c1. So we get v sub i equals c1, or which I wanted to look at what c1 is. So c1 is v sub i. Cool. All right. Now we have x prime to be a t plus v i. And uh, hmm, you probably bumped into this formula as well. V equals v sub i plus a t. Where did that come from? Well, from here. Now to find x, we'll we'll integrate both sides once again with respect to t. So integral of x prime dt would be this, integral of this right hand side with respect to t. And integral of x prime with respect to t is just x. a t, the integral is a t square over 2, v sub i over uh, v sub i times t plus an integration constant c sub 2. Right? Any thoughts on how to find c2? How did we find C1? We applied the initial condition on X prime. Any thoughts on how to find C2? Yep, you're right. Apply the initial condition on X. X of 0 equals X sub i. Plug T equal to 0 and X equals X sub i. And it reduces to C2 equals X sub i. Because this term goes to 0. You're multiplying by a 0 square. And here you are multiplying by a 0. So they go to zero and we get C2 to be X sub I. And so this is where we have. That's where the formula came from. So like I said, you did solve a second order initial value problem back in physics. Good. Let me give one more example of an initial value problem. There's something called a cantilever beam. The characteristic of a cantilever beam is it's just a beam. B meaning um, think of a long ruler. Okay. Uh, a ruler, if you were to hold one end real tight, let's say you stick it into a wall so that it doesn't move, you got a cantilever beam. Or some good old diving boards uh, in swimming pools. 
if you see, it's just a big long board. You walk up to the edge of it and you jump off into the water. So let's say you have a cantilever beam like that and you subject this to a moment like this. Uh, moment, couple. Okay. Um, so you subject this to a moment. What happens as a result? Uh, it bends. Now, when it bends, what is the deflection of each of these points? What do I mean by deflection? How much would these points move, each of these points, uh, how much would each of these points move in the y direction? Right? You can expect this point to move a lot more than this point. So the question is, what exactly is that deflection? That's what we want to solve. And it turns out the solution is governed by a differential equation, that whole problem, in the form of y double prime equals m over ei. The second derivative of y with respect to x, d square y dx square, equals m over ei. m is the moment that you are applying. E is Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity of the beam. Different materials have different values of E. And I is the moment of inertia. That moment of inertia depends on the shape of the cross section. Like cross section meaning you take this beam and, and you cut it and look at from perpendicular to that. And uh, you will see that it has a certain shape. For example, if this were to be just a, a circular cylindrical rod, the cross section is a circle. Sometimes people use eye beams, like the cross section would in fact be in the shape of an eye, uh, not E Y E, the letter I. Okay? So this is the governing differential equation. Now, would you agree this is a second order differential equation? Yep. And now, what are the initial conditions on this one? So notice, the dependent variable is y. If I'm calling this an initial value problem, I have to state what y at some x value is, and also y prime at the same x value. Those will form my initial conditions. Did you get that? Please, please, please. Absolutely, be sure to get that one. When I say this is the initial value problem, I have given you a differential equation. Now I owe you two more. I owe you two initial conditions. And the first condition is on y itself, y stated at some particular x value, and y prime stated at that same x value. Those are the things I owe you. Well, how do you find them? Where do you specify y? In this case, logically, it seems like I can tell you what y and y prime are at x equal to zero, the left end of the beam. Can I? What does y represent? How much the beam moves up and down in the vertical direction? Is the left end point capable of moving up and down? No, the left end is completely fixed, so it cannot move up and down. So you look at that and immediately say, aha, so you mean y of zero equals zero. Yes, yes, y of zero is in fact equal to zero. When you bend, this moves like this, this curves like that, the bend, the beam does. Well, I didn't draw the whole beam, I just drew what is called the neutral axis of the beam. This point, as you can see, at x equal to zero, has not moved up and down. Well, that's the nature. So, y of zero clearly is equal to zero. Now, I need to specify y prime also at zero. What in the world is y prime? Oh, y prime is dy dx is the slope of the tangent. 
Now we go back to your calculus one, the very basics. Y prime represents the derivative, the slope of the tangent. If this is the shape of the curve, which represents the bent beam, what is the slope of the tangent drawn here? Clearly zero, right? Because this end is fixed like that, the beam has to bend like this, leaving this y prime at zero to be zero. So those are the initial conditions. The geometry, the physics of the problem, they determine what the initial conditions should be. Now, if you understood all of this, that's fine. If you didn't, not a big deal. I'm just trying to give you a motivation as to why the hell are we learning about differential equations and all this. These are the kinds of things that you will actually bump into. Uh, I think when you take mechanics and materials, you, you will have this problem, deflection of a beam subjected to both a, a cantilever beam and what's called a simply supported beam. Okay. Here, that's the idea, folks. And then the next thing we need to cover is what is called a boundary value problem. When it comes to a boundary value problem, we will just stick with a second order boundary value problem, uh, third order and all that are going to be pain. So let's just stick with a second order boundary value problem and talk about it. Once again, you'll have a similar differential equation, a second order linear differential equation but this time, the boundary conditions, those are the things. You are subjecting you to boundary conditions and not initial conditions. What do they look like? They look like this. The first condition looks like alpha sub 1 times y of a plus beta 1 y prime of a equals gamma 1. And the second condition looks like alpha 2 y of b plus beta 2 y prime of b equals gamma 2. Does that scare the wits out of you when you look at it? If I were to be you, yes. I'd like, what the heck is that, man? Um, but then I'm here to explain to you what in the world all of this is. This is not really all that complicated. Alpha 1 beta 1, gamma 1, alpha 2, beta 2, gamma 2, they are all just constants. Okay. People in the business use those terms. We could, if I said a1, then a1 represents the coefficient of dy dx. We don't want you to be confused with that. Maybe I could have said p1, q1, r1. Yeah, but then, you know, we had p in, in the previous thing was something else. So, Anyway, all this is saying is just some constant times y of a. What is y? Oh, our dependent variable y. What is a? Some x value. X is, x's value in this case is a. x equals a. So the value of y at x equal to a times some constant alpha 1 plus some other constant beta 1 times the value of y prime at that same x equals a. Together, that's equal to some gamma 1, some number. For example, this could very well look like 2 times y of 1 plus 3 times y prime of 1 is equal to 4. Right? 2 times y of 1 plus 3 times y prime of 1 one must be the same. You are stating both the conditions at the same place. Should equal some number, 4. And here, notice this one. While the first condition was stated at x equals a, this condition should not be stated at that same x value. Instead, it is stated at some b, x equals b. Cool. Again, some constant times the value of y at b plus some other constant times y prime's value at b should equal some other some number. This is how the boundary conditions should look like. Now, the question is, could a be zero? Yeah. 
could a and b both be zero this lower case a and b no that's a no no if a is zero b cannot be zero okay only one of them if the could potentially be zero but if that is not the case neither is zero neither a nor b is zero that's perfectly fine could alpha one be zero most certainly could beta one be zero yes so in fact alpha one beta one gamma one and all these alpha two betas gamma two they could be zero not all of them but some of them could be zero if all of them are zero then we don't have any boundary conditions we don't want that <clears throat> let me show you an example of this and a not equal to b are two points in the domain a must not equal b that's the key there's another beam called simply supported beam so it's like instead of both ends being one end being totally completely fixed this is just something think of it as two knife edges and the beam is just sitting on those knife edges okay that's a simply supported beam typically people in the business put a roller support here so that it allows for this one of the ends to move left and right so that it doesn't cause any any internal stresses as this bends so now let's say this is subjected to a moment m okay a simply supported beam like this this would take would, uh, would it bend like that yeah so this would this beam would bend like this and have a, a shape something similar to the, so something like this so we our objective again is to figure out what the deflection of the beam is that means what are the y values are different x values how do you deal with that you will have the exact same differential equation as you did before for the cantilever beam y double prime is m over ei m is the moment e is the young's modulus and i is the moment of inertia and now when it comes to conditions what should happen the conditions should be stated at two different places okay and y of 0 y prime of uh, sorry y of a y of y prime of a y of b y prime of b logically what seems like a good thing do we know anything about the deflection at any place hey the left end that point cannot move up and down so that means its deflection is zero so let's go ahead and say that why how do you say that mathematically that means y of zero that means y when x equal to zero is zero similarly can the right point move up and down no so how do we state that y at what x equals what at this right side end is equal to l the beam has a length of l so y of l is equal to zero that's it those are the boundary conditions now if you are going wait a minute come on those conditions looked uh, awfully scary when you said alpha one y of a beta one y prime of a and this man now you're just telling me the the boundary conditions are just y of zero equals zero and y of l equals zero these don't look anything like these two man come on really these do not look like this these they of course do uh y of zero equals zero let's say that is this condition can i not say that what is a y of a well this is y of zero cool but where's the alpha one man well alpha one is one 
right? If I make a to be 0 and alpha 1 to be 1, would the first term be 1 times y of 0? That is just simply y of 0, the first term. Okay, fine. But where is your y prime of 0? I don't know what y prime of 0 is. But this one doesn't have a y prime of 0. No, it does. What? I'm not blind. I know. y prime of 0 still exists in this condition. But it just so happens that beta 1 is 0. Can that happen? Of course it can. You see the idea? So, by, by letting alpha 1 to be 1, beta 1 to be 0, and in fact gamma 1 also to be 0, and a to be 0, oh nearly. This just reduces to y of 0 equals 0. Similarly, alpha 2 equals 1, beta 2 equals 0, gamma 2 is equal to 0, b on the other hand equals l. Reduces this whole thing down to y of l equals 0. You will have to, once you start taking uh, ME guys and civil guys, when you start taking these courses, this is something you need to do. Mechanics and materials, machine design. You have to figure out from this, what are the boundary conditions? Looking at the physics of the problem. Okay, all right. So, if that interested you, wonderful. If it did not and you didn't understand a word I said, eh, don't worry about it. Next, the concept I need to cover is what is called linear dependence. Functions f1 through f sub n are said to be linearly dependent on an interval i if there exist constant c1 through c sub n, not all simultaneously zero, such that c1 f1 of x plus c2 f2 of x plus dot 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 c sub n f1 f n of x equals zero. Um, uh, uh, what? What's up with this symbol? Well, that is for all x. And what with this funny looking e? Is an element of or in? Simply people say is in or e is an element of. So for all x in i, that's how you read this. Cool. Um, that, yeah, for all x in i. <clears throat> What does this mean? Check this out. The question is, hey, I'm giving you n functions, f1 of x, f2 of x, f3 of x, like that, fn of x. Now I'm asking you, are these functions linearly dependent on some interval? Interval like 0 to 10, or 0 to infinity, or negative infinity to infinity. Are these functions linearly dependent? To be able to answer that question, <clears throat> you need to see if there exist constant c1 through cn such that when you add c1 times f1 of x plus c2 times f2 of x and all that, that just turns out to be 0. And that is true for all values of x in whatever the interval I'm asking you about. If that happens, if you can find these constants, then these functions are said to be linearly dependent. I'll give you plenty of examples. If you didn't understand, I don't know, man, somehow. That went way over my head. Yeah, don't worry about it. Let me ask you one thing. Suppose I make C1, C2, C3, every one of these things, all these C subs, they all are all zero. Then, wouldn't this automatically be true? Zero times some function is zero, plus zero times something. Every one of these things, yeah, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. So adds up to zero, right? The only thing is, that is a no-no. 
you can make some of these constants zero, but at least one of them should be non-zero. Not all can be, not all constants e1 through cn can simultaneously be zero. That's a no-no. Okay. Having said that, uh, now I'll show you quite a few examples so that you will really grasp it. <clears throat> Here I'm giving you three functions f1, f2, and f3. And I'm asking you, are these three functions linearly independent or are they dependent on my interval happens to be the entire real number line, negative infinity to infinity. So, what are we looking for? Hey, can I come up with some constants c1, c2, c3? There are three functions, so three constants such that c1 times this first function plus c2 times the second function x square plus c3 times this will be zero for all values of x. <clears throat> Can we? In other words, I don't know what to plug in for c1 yet. And for f1 of x is x, f2 of x, I plugged in x square and so on. Can I put some numbers here? Numbers, please pay attention to that part. You cannot put variables here. You must put numbers, constants. So that the moment I multiply and add, I must get zero identically. That means must be zero, doesn't matter what X I pick. <clears throat> For that, you need to be a tad clever. Check this out. What if I put a 1 here? That makes this 1 times 4x minus 3x square. Hmm, okay. We have a plus 4x. To get rid of that 4x, what if I made the coefficient of x to be negative 4 here? So I'll make c1 as negative 4. That would take, that would make this negative 4x and this is a 1 times 4x is positive 4x. So this uh, negative 4x here and a positive 4x add up to 0. So that's gone. And I notice this is a 1 times negative 3x square. So we have a minus 3x square. So cleverly, if I were to make this into a 3, then we would have 3x square minus 3x square. That also is 0. Right? So, I can come up with constants like negative 4 at 3 for C2 and 1 for C3 such that this is 0 identically, meaning for all values of x. Right? So, was I capable of, did I successfully find constant c1, c2, c3 such that c1 x plus c2, c1 f of x plus c2 f of c1 f1 of x plus c2 f2 of x plus c3 f3 of x is actually zero? Yes, it is. I found such constants. So that means these functions are linearly dependent on negative infinity to infinity. Cool. Okay, I got it, man. But what's with this stupid linearly dependent or linearly independent? Why should I care about that? Ah, oh, you should care about it because it that concept comes in in quite a few places. Those of you who are taking matrix algebra, you must have come across some things like that. Hey, are these rows linearly dependent or independent? When you're looking at the rank of a matrix, computing the rank of a matrix and stuff like that. Let me put it this way. Um, if you have two unknowns, how many equations should you have to be able to find those two unknowns? Two, right? Cool. So you are promising that if I can find, if I can give you two equations, you will find a solution, unique solution, right? X plus Y equals two. Have I given you one equation? 
yes here is a second equation 2x plus 2y equals 4 can you find a unique solution with this now no matter how much you try you cannot there are infinite number of solutions to this one but you cannot find a unique a single solution to this why not because these two equations are not linearly independent they are linearly dependent how do i know well if i multiply this equation by 2 that is and multiply this equation by negative 1 and when i add them up i get 0 right 0 equals 0 or better yet this equation that you see in the bottom is nothing but 2 times the first equation so that is not linearly independent the second one is dependent on the first one right that's why there are no unique solutions you bump into the same concept uh, even in differential equations that's why we need to establish whether or not the given functions are linearly independent on a certain interval okay next f1 of x equals 0 f2 of x is equal to x f3 of x equals e to the x are these linearly independent or dependent on negative infinity to infinity some blank times the first function plus blank times second function so on can you fill in the blanks the only thing is you are not allowed to make every one of these blanks as zero that means c1 c2 c3 they are all simultaneously zero that's a no no can you do that can you come up with some numbers What did I say? All these constants, C1, C2, C3, cannot be zero. So that means if one of them is non-zero, that's okay? Uh, yes. That's a hint. You get it? One of them, as long as one of them constants is non-zero, we are good. The rest of them could all be zero. We don't care so would you agree if I make the first constant to be 1 because it is multiplying 0 I don't it doesn't matter what pick what number I what constant I pick here I can pick 1 2 1 1.5 pi whatever and make sure that C2 and C3 are 0 yep see so I have picked C1 C2 C3 such that c1 f1 of x plus c2 f2 of x plus c3 f3 of x is sum is identically zero for all values of x on the real number line <clears> hmm <throat> how about some like this again i do that and now you are expected to recall some identities. Hey, wait a minute. Sine square x plus cosine square x is equal to 1. Mm-hmm. So, very cleverly, if we make this into 1 and a 1, we have sine square x plus cosine square x is equal to 1. But what should we put here so that it becomes negative 1, which adds up and gives us 0? How about negative one-fifth? Right? We could do that. Or, what did I do? Eh, I put negative one for C1 and five and five for C2 and C3. That would work. Right? So, we have found these constants. So, these are Lin these functions, three functions, are linearly dependent on negative infinity to infinity. 
Now, there's something called a Ronskian. The Ronskian of functions f1 through f1, fn, is a certain determinant. Uh, those of you who are taking algebra, I mean linear algebra or matrix algebra, you probably have bumped into this, right? You, so you need to find a determinant of a certain matrix. And in the first row, we are talking about, we know the functions f1 through fn. First row, that's what you would have. Each, each of those functions, f1, f2, f3, f4, all the way up to fn. Those are the elements of the first row. And in the second row, you will have f1 prime, the first derivative of f1 and first derivative of f2 and so on. And the second derivative in the third row and so on. Finally, the n minus 1th derivative in the last one. Cool. Let me ask you something. How many columns do we have? Columns. We start with F1. We go to 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to N. How many columns is that? N columns. Right? So, how many rows you must have? What do you mean? There could be any number of rows, man. No, if there are n columns and we are computing the determinant of the matrix, what must happen? A matrix must be square. So that means if there are n columns, there better be n rows. And sure enough, zeroth derivative in the first row, first derivative in the second row, and all the way up to n minus one the derivative in the nth column. Rather, nth row, sorry, nth row. n minus one the derivative in the nth row. Apologize. Okay, so if you compute this determinant, you are said to have uh, found the Ronskian of these functions. Okay, why? What do we care about this stupid Ronskian? That's because if the Ronskian is not equal to zero at some x sub zero in the interval, again, this is talking about whether functions are linearly independent or dependent on an interval. Suppose you compute the Ronskian of this for n functions, and it turns out that Ronskian, the determinant, is not equal to zero at one measly point x sub zero in this whole interval. Then you are guaranteed that the functions are linearly independent on i. What is that? If the Ronskian is not equal to zero at some x sub zero in this whole interval, automatically the functions are linearly independent on i. See if you can remember that. I'll solve plenty of examples though. Determine, by finding the Ronskian, determine whether these functions are linearly independent on negative infinity to infinity. On purpose, I picked a simple one. Okay. In fact, without Ronskin, can you tell me if these are dependent or linear, uh, independent? Blank times x plus blank times 2x is equal to 0. Can you put blank numbers in blanks? Yeah, negative 2 times x plus 1 times 2x is simultaneous, is identically 0. Right? So clearly these are dependent, linearly dependent. But let's establish that using the Ronskian. Ronskian, if you have two functions, the first row should be f1 and f2. The second row should be f1 prime and f2 prime. Because there are two functions, there are two columns, and there must be two rows. Right? Cool. And now let's x 
and 2x are f1, f2. The derivative of x is 1, derivative of 2x is 2. Now we need to compute the determinant of this matrix. Do you know how to compute the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix? Yep, you cross multiply these two, x times 2 is 2x, minus 1 times 2x. So 2x minus 2x, that's equal to 0. Okay. Wait, the Ronskian turned out to be identically 0? Yeah. So that means there is not a single value of x sub 0 in this interval negative infinity to infinity where w is not equal to 0. It w is 0 everywhere for every value of x in negative infinity to infinity. So these are linearly dependent. These functions f1 and f2 are linearly dependent on negative infinity to infinity. Okay. I hope you got just a little bit of a hang of this one. The next one. So there is no x sub 0 in this interval where w is not equal to 0. So these guys are linearly dependent. All right. Let's look at tangent x and cotangent x. And the interval happens to be the open interval 0 to pi halves. Two functions. So two columns and two rows, first row f1 and f2, second row f1 prime and f2 prime. Tangent x and cotangent x in the first row. Derivative of tangent x is secant square x. Derivative of cotangent x is negative cosecant square x. Determinant Cross multiply these two, tangent x times negative cosecant square x minus cotangent x times secant square x. Right? Hmm. Can we simplify this? Uh, ta -da -ta -ta. Isn't this negative 2 over sine x cosine x? Can I write tangent x as sine x over cosine x and cosecant square x as 1 over sine square x? Yeah. So sine x simplifies with one of these sine x. So sine x cosine x is what we are left here. Similarly, sine x cosine x. So this is just negative 2 over cosine x sine x. So if we simplify this, this is what the W, the Ronskian ends up being. But that's not the question. The question is not to find the Ronskian. There was a part of it. Hmm. Can you answer about the linear independence or dependence? Now please remember what the theorem said. The theorem said, if the Ronskian is not equal to 0 at some x sub 0 in the interval, then these functions are linearly independent. W not 0 at some x naught, then automatically linearly independent. So, can you come up with some value for x in this interval 0 to pi half, 0 not included, pi half not included. Though don't tell me, well, I'll take uh, uh, x to be 0, man. No, you cannot. 0 is not included. What about pi fourths? Right? Cosine of pi fourths, 45 degrees. Cosine of pi, pi fourths is 45 degrees. So cosine of pi fourths, square root of 2 over 2. Sine of pi 4, square root of 2 over 2. Hey, cause square root of 2 over 2 times square root of 2 over 2 is 2 over 4, or 1 half. Negative 2 over 1 half is negative 4. Ta-da! When you evaluate the Ronskian at pi fourths, we get a non-zero quantity. 
right? All we needed to find was one x, one measly x sub zero where the Ronskian wouldn't be zero. And we found such pi over four. Now, God forbid, if there is some other x value at which, please pay attention to this. If there is some other x value inside this interval where this is equal to zero, we don't care. We care about whether it is not equal to zero at some x sub zero. And we have found one. x sub zero equals pi fourths satisfies that condition. The round scan turns out to be the non-zero number negative four. So these functions are linearly independent on zero to pi halves. Cool. All right. What about uh, three functions? Similar, it's just that it's a bit of a pain uh, finding the determinant. In fact, what I have decided to do is because the derivatives tend to be just a little bit more involved, uh, we'll take care of the derivatives. F1 of x is x, F1 prime of x, therefore, derivative of x is 1, derivative of 1 is 0, that's F double prime, F1 double prime of x. Okay, f2 of x, on the other hand, is x natural log of x. So here we need to apply the product rule to get f2 prime. First function x times the second function derivative is 1 over x, plus second function times the derivative of the first function gives us this. And it's a good idea to simplify this part. x times 1 over x is 1. So that's what I wrote. Then, to get f2 double f2 double prime, take the derivative of the first derivative. Derivative of one is zero. Derivative of natural log of x is one over x. Cool. Similarly, for f3 of x, uh, you figure this out. Trust me, this is right. So we found all the derivatives and everything, and we are ready to plug in. So this time. We have three functions, so we'll have three columns. Automatically, that means there must be three rows, with the first row being f1, f2, f3, second being the first derivatives, and the third row being double primes. And that's why we found all the double primes, all the way up to double prime. Okay. So how do you find the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix? The way you do this is, you can expand about any row, any row, or any column. Are you with me? We are almost done. So pay attention if you, or if you need to take a pause, go ahead and do it. But I think this is probably the last problem. Yep, it is. So how do you find the determinant of a 3 by 3? Choose either any row or any column that you, you that you feel like. But it's a good idea to pick a row or a column that has a zero in it, because that that makes life a little bit simple. Okay, so looks like I have chosen to pick the first column. So I will expand everything about the first column. What do I mean by expand everything about the first column? What I mean is. I need to now pick this element x. So that's what you see here, x times the determinant of a two by two matrix. What is this two by two matrix? Where did that come from? Now pay attention. Because I picked this element, the next thing I need to do is mentally cross this row out and also this column out. Cool. What would that leave me? That leaves me with this sub matrix. That is exactly what you see here. Would you agree? First row gone, first column gone, you are left with only these four. 1 plus natural log of x, x plus 2x natural log of x. That's what you see here in the first row. 1 over x and 3 plus 2 natural log of x. That's what you see in the second row. Cool. Then there's a one here. 
and that's the one that you see here. How come there's a negative? Ah, that ex I, I owe you an explanation on that. But all I want to first show you is that I'm using that one here times a two by two matrix. Where did I get that from? How do I get that? Again, the same principle. Cross out that row in which you have one and also that column in which you have one. So that leaves us with x natural log of x, x square natural log of x. These are gone. One over x, three plus two natural log of x. That's what I wrote here. Similarly, zero times, cross out this row, cross out that column, you're left with those. So that's what I wrote here. But the beauty of it is we don't care what this is because we're being multiply, we are multiplying that by a zero. And did I do that? Uh, I didn't explain. Oh, come on, Samuel. How come we have a plus here and a plus here, but a minus here? Here is the idea. We should use negative one raised to row plus column. Okay, negative one raised to row plus column. What do I mean by that? Here we used x. What is the row value of this element? It is in the first row, so r equals one. Which column is it in? The first column, so c equals one. So negative one raised to one plus one, which is negative one square, is positive one. That's why this is an addition plus. However, if you go to this element one, its row is two, it's in the second row. Column is still one. So negative one to the two plus one is negative one cube. That's negative. That's why you see this to be negative. On the other hand, zero is in third row, first column. So negative one to the three plus one is negative one to the four, which is positive one. So that's why you see this to be positive. That's the idea. And then you do all of this, you cross multiply and all of that. Um, you look at um, this work and <clears throat> all that reduces to 2x plus x natural log of x. So what are we supposed to do? On the interval 0 to infinity, open interval 0 to infinity, are these functions x, x natural log of x, x square natural log, are they linearly independent or dependent? Can you come up with one value for x where this quantity would be non-zero? I'm not looking for a zero value. I'm looking for a non-zero value. Could you pick x equals one? Would that work? Two times one is two. One times natural log of one. Natural log of one is zero. So one times zero is, that part is zero. So two plus zero. Hey, two plus zero is two, and that's not equal to zero. So we have found a value for x sub zero, such that the Ronskian at that value is non-zero. So that means these functions are linearly independent on that interval zero to infinity. Cool? That's the idea. So, friends, Get busy and start working on problems 15 through 28 in exercise 4.1. Amigos y amigas, adios.